Excellent. Hey guys, welcome back to Paul's Hardware. This is Probing Paul, number 35, my monthly Q&A. I will be answering your questions that were posted in last month's Probing Paul, which you can check out if you want to look at the Probing Paul playlist. Uh, it goes back pretty far these days. That's impressive. But uh, I will link that down in the video's description. All of the questions I'm answering today are taken from the comments of last month's video, so feel free to leave a comment in this month's video if you're interested in me possibly answering it next month. Hit the thumbs up button while you're down there, uh, but only, of course, if you watch the entire video and enjoy the things I have to say. Let's get right into it with our first question. This is from June Tay, and he says, Are M.2 heatsinks necessary? I just acquired a used motherboard, and it doesn't have a heatsink with it. Uh, no, they're absolutely not necessary. In fact, there's some sort of weird things with M.2 heatsinks that not everyone is aware of. First off, you don't always need them depending on the speed and the performance of the drive. The fastest drives, like uh, Samsung's higher-end drives like a 970 Pro and 970 Evo, can get pretty hot if they're under sustained loads for a very long period of time. So consider how you'll be using your M.2 drive. If it's just going to be an operating system drive in a gaming PC, then it's not going to get a lot of heavy sustained use over time, especially with heavy loads from writes. If you're using it for video editing or something like that, well then you might want to consider that it might get hot over time. But the other thing to consider is that you don't necessarily want to cool down everything on the SSD itself. There is the controller, which you can sometimes d distinguish from the other chips because it looks different. You'll usually have multiple chips that look the same. That's NAND flash. And then you have another chip that's your controller. Controllers you want to keep cool. So if you do get a heatsink, make sure that the heatsink goes over the controller, but not necessarily the NAND. NAND actually likes to be warmer. It's better for NAND to be warmer while it's being written to, and then it's better for it to be cooler when it's just not being used at all. So you'd actually want to avoid a heatsink on the NAND for extended writes, but you would want to keep that controller cool. So that is really where I think the problem and the confusion lies. That said, for most SSDs and for most home usage in a gaming system, you're never going to hit the SSD hard enough for it to get warm enough. And even if it does get warm enough, it's just going to throttle itself. It'll dial back the speeds a little bit so it doesn't overheat, and it'll still finish writing your data. It's not going to suddenly explode or stop working or anything like that. So for my money, in most situations, just don't worry about a heat sink on your SSD. If your mother board comes with one, feel free to go ahead and install it. It's not like it's going to hurt the drive, but consider that a lot of SSDs now, the label that's on top is actually a heat sink label. It will help distribute heat across the NAND chips as well as the controller. So if you do drop a heat sink on there, it is not a bad idea to remove the label from the NAND so the NAND can actually get warmer and you'll have better heat transfer from the controller. Next question from David Montaigne who says, hi Paul, love the series, long time watcher, first time prober. Don't worry, David, you always remember your first time. Uh, but the question is, how can I benchmark my own games to see if the FPS I'm actually getting is in line with what I had expected from watching hardware reviews from yours and other channels? I have a feeling I'm getting less than I should be. This is a good question. I'm actually surprised it doesn't come up a little more often because when you look at hardware reviews and benchmarks of like a graphics card, you'll often see a $200 or $300 graphics card paired with the best possible processor, like a $500, 9900K. You might get that same graphics card and install it on your system where you're using a perfectly adequate R5 2600 or something like that, but maybe not quite the same performance as you get out of a 9900K. And then the question you're invariably going to have is why is my performance going to be a little bit behind the professional review that I've seen or have compared to? The best way to get a good idea of this, which is practically impossible for most people is to find a reviewer who has used your exact same configuration. And then even beyond that, you'd have to look at the specific settings they're using for the game because they might be running at high settings here. There might be one or two little settings that they have changed that can significantly affect the actual performance in that game that you might not have set up. So David, where I would point you actually is synthetics in this specific circumstance. Granted, take the games that you play, try to find a diverse array of reviews that have tested that game with your hardware or at least your graphics card, and then you should be able to get kind of a ballpark range of what you should expect. But if you can get a synthetic benchmark, I would recommend 3D Mark because they have multiple tests in multiple DirectX 11, DirectX 12, uh, VR, and ray tracing as well. Uh, you can download most of the basic tests for free, run the tests, and then you'll actually see all of their results. I don't have a direct example right now, but I pulled this image up online because they give you this run details sheet where it shows your performance 
and comparable systems performance as well. So you can look at those charts and sort of get an idea, like is there something that's holding my system back or am I kind of within the range where I should be? Because uh, chances are, if you are in the range you should be, but you're not quite where you think you should be, there's just some minor things you could do, like maybe a little overclock or maybe you can mess with your memory settings or maybe you can again just double check the game settings that you're using to make sure that you've dialed things in appropriately if you're comparing it to an online test. Next question here is from Mike the Manic Geek. Hey Mike, how you doing man? Uh, he says, how hypey are you over Borderlands 3? And if you aren't hypey, why? Uh, I am moderately hypey, I suppose, over Borderlands 3, because I did play Borderlands 2, uh, and I beat it, and I played through the whole game, and you know, that's that's more rare for me these days, to have the, the time and be that involved with the game to play it through to the end. So that, you know, means that I enjoyed it, so I would hopefully enjoy the follow-up to it, Borderlands 3, and I probably am gonna try to play it. If I'm not as hyped as I should be, it's because, for one, I can't play as many video games or devote as much time playing video games these days as I used to, which kind of sucks, but also kind of goes hand in hand with getting a little bit older. Uh, but the other side of it is that, as you guys probably know, I have a baby on the way, should be born any minute now, and that will probably take away a little bit of my gaming time, which I'm perfectly fine with, but it just means that uh, by the time I get around to playing Borderlands 3, it might be a little old. But I'll definitely play it. I'm definitely excited about it, just um, not as excited as I could be because I know I'm gonna have limited time to actually devote to it. Next question from Killers34. Should we wait on Intel's 10 nanometer or pull the trigger on the 9900K? This is sort of the flip-flop to last month's headline question, which is should you buy Ryzen 2000 series now or wait for 3000 series? Intel should be launching 10 nanometer desktop parts this year. Um, it's still up in the air when they're actually going to come out. There's speculation that we might see something at Computex, but according to what Intel has said, it's probably gonna be later in the year. Um, so if you're already in that boat of where you're waiting for what Intel has next, I would say keep waiting. The 9900K is a very expensive processor. It's over $500. And I'm gonna bet that when AMD launches whatever they are planning to launch mid-year this year, probably in June or July, it's gonna put even more pressure on Intel to be competitive, to come out with a good product, not just a good product, but a product that they're going to have to price more competitively because they can only ride on that sort of historical Intel has the fastest processor for so long. And if any of the rumors are remotely true when it comes to the performance of AMD's Ryzen 3000 series, we're gonna look at a much, much closer uh, race when it comes to IPC performance, single core performance, and that is where Intel has the lead right now. So if AMD can bounce back with Ryzen 3000 series, then whatever Intel comes out with next, which I hope is good because they've been working on it for like three years, this 10 nanometer thing, if, if, if not longer than that, then by the end of this year, you should have a lot more options, a lot more performance available on the table, and you should have better prices as well. So that would be my recommendation right now. Don't grab a 9900K, they're very expensive. Uh, just, just wait. We've got a lot of stuff coming out later this year, and prices for everything else, like uh, SSDs and memory and everything, have been coming down as well, so um, I think you'll be in a better situation. Here is a long question from JJ Bonifacio. It's a question about an upgrade from an existing computer, which he lists here at the top, which has a 4690K, a Z97X gigabyte motherboard, a Radeon 390X GPU, 16 gigs of memory, and a Seasonic power supply. Uh, he's planning on handing this down to his nephew and building a new system, and he wants to know whether he should wait for third gen or not, or go the 2700X route. His planned upgrade is a Ryzen 5 2600X with a gigabyte B450 motherboard, a 1660 Ti, still 16 gigs of memory, but faster, as well as a uh, M.2 NVMe SSD, two terabyte hard drive, Fantex Eclipse P400. JJ, I will tell you that this is a good plan that you have here, but because you're already using a 4690K, I would say you should hold off for now because just as I said to previous question asker about the 9900K, we're looking at a bunch of upcoming launches, both from AMD and Intel right now. If you were dealing with an older system like that you were really struggling to get by with, I would say, you know, go ahead and invest right now because you're gonna be getting a nice upgrade. But you've got a 4690K, that's a good gaming processor, especially if you overclock it a bit. 
390X also still has legs on it. I mean, if you're gaming at 1080p, that should be doing a perfectly adequate job for you. If your nephew is like about to steal your computer, then maybe you've got no choice and you just need to invest now. But I would say because you're working with a pretty good existing system, uh, hold off a little bit because in, give, in another month or two, I think we're gonna be looking at a refreshed landscape when it comes to the CPU side, new motherboards, uh, lots of cool stuff like that. And I think it might be worth the wait. Just a couple more questions. This one's from Daniel Redziniak, who says, Micro Center has a 1600, that's the Ryzen 5 1600, for 80 bucks. I guess this isn't a question. It's more of an FYI for you guys. Plus, if you get a motherboard with it, you get an extra $30 off. Uh, here is that actual deal at Micro Center. Uh, even, even advertising right here, save 30 bucks when you bundle, bundle with a compatible, eligible motherboard. Micro Center has insanely good prices on CPUs, and uh, I, I feel like I bring them up from time to time, but I haven't for a while. So just to point it out to you guys who might not be aware that Micro Center exists, you have to go in store. So that is the downside to it. So there's a lot of regions that just don't have physical access to a Micro Center because there's not one near you. I have one I can get to down in Santa Ana, and the reason I even brought this up today was because uh, Joe, my editor, is actually picking up a Ryzen 5 1600 for the build testing that we're going to do tomorrow, uh, and it's it's only 80 bucks there. Online, you can get them for $115, which is still a really good deal, but $80 plus the $30 off of a motherboard, uh, just just crazy good. Um, I, I'm... I'm jealous for those of you who are able to buy a setup like this right now compared to people who didn't have access to that in the past, I guess. Uh, anyway, just kind of a, an FYI uh, for any of you guys who might have local access to a Micro Center, definitely hit them up. Uh, they don't always list these on PC Part Picker and stuff like that, though, so um, you kind of have to go directly and just make sure they have it in stock and keep an eye out for crazy deals on CPUs. David SJ next asks, Hey Paul, does skipping the commercials at the start of videos have a negative effect on monetization amounts as opposed to letting the commercials run to the end? Uh, he's asked this to a few people and they haven't known. I, David, to be perfectly honest, I don't know the direct answer to your question either, but uh, I'm pretty sure this is how it works. If you watch a pre-roll ad that plays at the beginning of a video that I post uh, and you wait for, until you can skip, because I always do skippable ads, I never do non-skippable ads, uh, then I get an impression for that and I believe I get commission from the advertiser. I think sometimes they do set up special deals where if it's a longer like minute or two minute ad or a full video and people watch the whole thing, um, then I, it might give me more commission. But like I said, I don't know a full direct answer for you. Maybe I shouldn't have answered this question today, but I do know that yes, even if you skip it, uh, I still get an impression on the ad and I still get some money for that. So that for me is like the best sort of in between. I can appreciate anyone who wants to use Adblocker or something like that. Don't blame you guys at all. There's plenty of websites that that is very useful for. I recommend uBlock Origin if you're going to do that. But if you guys do like my content, like watching my videos, if you've ever gained anything from it and you want to whitelist me, uh, I greatly appreciate that. But I don't hate on people who use Adblocker by any extent. But thanks for asking the question and just having that in mind in general. It is a significant part of my revenue the money I make and the way I'm able to keep making YouTube videos like this one. So if you guys do want to whitelist me, cool. If you want to watch the beginning of those ads, cool. Uh, if you watch the whole thing, like don't do that because I mean, if it's if it's interesting, if it's interesting and useful to you, then maybe you can. Thank you very much though, David. Uh, last question here. I guess this is not a question. This is just, I wanted to end the video on this note from Mark Andre B. 2019 is the year of Paul and uh, we should Paul all the things, which I just think is, a, is, is great. I actually hit like on this comment uh, right after I took the screen cap in case you're wondering whether or not I had liked the comment. Yes, uh, Paul all the things. I don't exactly know the right procedure of implementation of that policy, but I think we should uh, full steam ahead on that as of, as of today. So you guys have your instructions. Thank you so much for watching this video. And again, if you have questions for me to be answered next month, leave them in the comment section down below. Thanks again for watching guys, and we'll see you next time.